Thank you, Rabbi Seth. And thank you all for having us again. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, last week, Eric and I discussed the foundational principle that we think is necessary to have tough conversations, especially in the time that we're living in. And that is pursuing truth is a greater goal than merely proving your point. And we saw that this is what the rabbis called an argument for the sake of heaven, as opposed to an argument not for the sake of heaven in Parsha Korach. And we wanted to start this way because the other guidelines we're covering stem from this foundational principle. So this morning, Eric and I will present these 11 other guidelines. And just to keep in mind, uh, we'll post this on the Two Messianic Jews YouTube channel, and the service is on the Sharei Shalom YouTube channel. And with all that said, let's get into the second principle. Clinical psychologist Dr. Jordan Peterson says, Assume that the person you are listening to knows something you don't. When we approach a conversation, assuming that we actually have something to learn from our conversation partner, this has the potential to change what could have been a heated debate where both parties end up destroying the other person to a beautiful time of learning from one another in the pursuit of truth. This is what Rabbi Stuart Dowerman, a point Rabbi Stuart Dower made in the Parsha of Bilam, where Bilam is a pagan prophet, and yet God communicates to him through a donkey. And somehow I can't think of this story without thinking of the movie Shrek. Uh, but what Rabbi Stuart says I think is key related to this. He says, Torah is telling us that God who could speak truth through the mouth of a donkey can also speak true prophecy about his chosen people through the mouth of a pagan prophet. Honestly, anyone is capable of communicating truth. And in a difficult conversation, the person you're engaging with, they might have a thousand wrong views, but they actually might have the right view in that conversation. So the point is to be willing to hear truth from, from them. Maimonides put it this way, you should listen to the truth, whoever may have said it. Absolutely. That's definitely one that's helped me out a lot in uh, tough conversations that I've had. And again, just Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you so much for having us again. It has really been a blessing to get the opportunities to speak with all of you. And yeah, as Jonathan is say was saying, very covering a lot of points, but they will be posted online to re-listen and, and take more notes if you'd like. So jumping into the next one, number three, it is seek to understand before being understood. And I think most of us have heard this one before, so I'll just give some practical ways in which we can accomplish this. So I think that the best way to know if you're understanding your conversation partner is if you attempt to repeat what they said back to them in your own words. So this is easy to forget in the heat of the moment, but if you do not understand what they are saying, then your response to that is irrelevant and that's just something you you don't want. So if they are not satisfied with your repetition, it is then helpful to ask, or you can do this before you attempt to repeat them, is asking them what they mean by the key words and phrases they are using. You guys may be using the same words, but defining them differently, and that's something you like to find out. And so these two practices will enable you and your conversation partner to actually exchange your ideas instead of misunderstanding and responding in irrelevant ways. And I think we find this principle in Proverbs 18:13. It says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Absolutely. And uh, so the fourth principle I want to cover from there is understand that feeling uncomfortable is often a good sign. So I'm sure at some point we've all felt uncomfortable in a conversation. And a lot of times we might assume that this is a negative thing. You may feel that the person you're engaged with is judging you personally and, and their arguments and it might feel like an attack on your character. But that's not necessarily true. I think Dr. Rudolph makes an excellent point when he writes, follow the disturbance. If you're in a conversation with another person and you have a disagreement over an important matter and you start feeling disturbed, ask yourself, why is this the case? Did the person you're conversing with make a good point? Did you not make a good point? Embrace the disturbance because, as Dr. Rudolph points out, this often leads to true thinking. This is your chance to grow, and the disturbance can mean that there's a weakness in your position, that it's been exposed, and you have the opportunity to find out that there's a problem in your argument. But if you do that, that just takes you one step closer to discovering what is actually true. So if there's a problem with your view, you have the freedom to drop that view and get closer to the truth. Another thing to point out is that feeling uncomfortable can also mean that you're having a meaningful discussion. 
if you think about it, most of the meaningful activities we're engaged with is like service projects, creating something with your bare hands, hitting your personal best in a workout. These all involve a level of discomfort. So discomfort can be an indication of meaning. And then number five, know that you can passionately hold to an opinion while still listening, understanding, and being open to the contrary. So the purpose of this rule is to ensure you that just because these principles tend to take the heightened emotion out of a conversation, at least for me, it does not mean you're not allowed to passionately hold and share an opinion. There's nothing wrong with this inherently. Just make sure that this is done with a healthy balance of still seeking to understand and being open to being shown you're wrong or that you're not being precise enough in your language. It is possible to do both. But if you do find yourself raising your voice or, or getting worked up, it helps just to, just to say, look, I know I'm getting worked up. It's just because I care. I'm still listening to you. And then, you know, try your best to, to tone it down. Um, but this just ensures that your conversation partner is confident that you are still in a pursuit of truth and not just trying to prove your point. Absolutely. And the sixth point is do not assume anything about your conversation partner's moral character or intellectual position based on hearsay or stereotypes. Listen to the individual. It's nearly guaranteed they do not fully live up to their stereotype. And this became evident, really evident to me, when a few years ago, Eric and I were up in Brooklyn, and we were invited into the home of an Orthodox rabbi to discuss a number of fascinating topics. And I went into the conversation trying to get an idea of what this rabbi would probably say. And of course, these were mostly stereotypes that I had of what an Orthodox rabbi would say in, in this kind of conversation, right or wrong, that's just, I was trying to go into it that way. But again, it all depends on the individual. And this definitely became evident to me when this rabbi started to say things that I would never expect an Orthodox rabbi to say. We were, we were talking about Deuteronomy 13 and the Torah, and through the conversation, some of the questions I was asking, this rabbi told me that he believes we probably don't know if the Torah that God gave us was a deception. And I didn't know that's where he was coming from, but I asked questions, and this really reminded me not to assume the beliefs of an individual based off of stereotypes. The way you find out people's positions, what they actually are, is by asking questions. It's by listening to them. And it's important for everyone to understand each other well. That's, that's how we can all be understanding. And I think this principle is found in Proverbs 18, verse 2, which says, The fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. So the point here is that we need to seek to understand the views of the people that we're talking to. And... Going from here, the, se the seventh principle that we want to go over is recognize that everyone has biases and pointing out their bias doesn't make them wrong. So if you stand on a certain side of an issue and the person you're conversing with stands on the polar opposite, pointing out their bias is really just a recognition that they're human, right? Uh, Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine says being biased is not the same thing as being wrong. And I think we can take this a step further. Because I actually think bias can be a good thing. Because bias enables you to see things people without that same bias fail to see. And one great example of this is the study of Paul within Judaism. For many, many centuries, Christian scholars reading the New Testament have viewed Paul as a Christian who abandoned Judaism, forsaking his commitment to Torah observance. However, starting in the late uh, 20th century, Jewish scholars examining these same letters of Paul and Acts some of these scholars are seeing that Paul was a Torah observant Jew and their Jewish bias allows them to see things that Christian scholars have failed to see. And it's incredible to see the growing interest in Paul within Judaism, not only with Jewish scholars, but Christian scholars as well, and reading Paul in this way. And also people with different biases can help you where you have blind spots. So if you embrace, so if you embrace your bias and learn from the people with a radically alternative bias than you, both of you will greatly benefit. And I think keeping this in mind will allow you, what the result will be is humility, allowing you to fulfill what Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfishness or conceit, but with humility, considering others as more important than yourselves, looking out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then number eight is remember that talking is thinking. 
So I finally grasped this principle once I realized how many stupid thoughts I have before I get to a reasonable one. I, I noticed it takes a whole lot of attempts and revisions. Then it requires another level of thinking in order to, in order to constrain your thoughts within the confines of coherent sentences, and this, again, often takes many attempts. So in the same way we have many dumb thoughts before we have a reasonable thought, we say what we want to say in many dumb ways before we say it in a reasonable way. And it's important to keep in mind that this could be occurring with the person you are speaking with. So try your best to be patient and have mercy on them. Try to take the attitude of helping them articulate by asking similar questions as in principle number three. Ask them what they mean. Ask them to clarify themselves. This will help them hone in on what they are actually trying to say and enable you to truly hear what they think. And this will lead to a genuine exchange of ideas, which is much better than pouncing on or getting upset at whatever first draft they may say to you. I think Luke 6.36 gives us a very another foundational principle, which is be merciful even as your father is merciful. Luckily, God gives us many attempts at correcting our path before enacting punishment. Let's try our best to do the same with others. So those are our guidelines for listening. Now we'll, we will give you a few guidelines for speaking. So as we speak, here is principle number nine, is understand how easy it is to be wrong. So the best way to understand how easy it is to be wrong is to pick a topic, any topic, and read widely and deeply about it. When you do this, you will experience what psychologists call the Dunning-Kruger effect. So this is something a couple of scholars discovered and that is that it only takes a little bit of research, like reading the Wikipedia page or only a couple of articles, for us to feel really confident about our knowledge on a certain topic. This is because at this point, we only know all that we know, so it feels like we know everything. Does that make sense? Um, but then, when we begin to do deeper research and read articles written by people of different biases, we begin to get a feel for how much we don't know. And this sends into what the scholars call a pit of despair, where we don't feel like we have any confidence whatsoever in uh, what we believe. But at least at this point, we ha are grasping how much we don't know. And we're be beginning to get a feel for the landscape of what we don't know. We know what subtopics and relevant evidence to look for to cover our blind spots. So then we continue to read, think, and talk with others about the topic to learn about what we don't know and this causes us to rise steadily back up the confidence ladder. But this does take a lot of time, thought, and hard work. Very few of us have time to go through this process for every important topic. So I've done this with something like interpreting Romans 14, but I've never done this with something like uh, investigating America's debt crisis and the best solution to that. So like this is something I know very little about, but because I'm aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, I know not to become too invested about my current opinion because there's a greater chance I'm wrong than I am right. This gives me a sense of humility when I do have conversations about topics I know little about, and it helps to just state this up front. Just tell the person, look, I haven't researched this enough to have a firm conclusion. Please tell me more about it. And this just frees you up to have a, this frees you up from having to defend an uninformed position and allows you to just listen, learn, and pursue truth. And again, I think this is found in 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone, thinks, if anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Absolutely. And I think this really leads into the 10th principle. And that is, know that admitting you're wrong is not a display of weakness, but of courage. And this is probably the most difficult guideline on our list, but it's, it's really important. Admitting you're wrong is painful, and when we have devoted so much time and energy to a certain view, it can feel like an attack on our character to admit that we're wrong. But really, it's a sign that you have good character. It takes a courageous person to admit when they are wrong. But I think it's important to keep in mind that if someone makes a good point or provides a powerful response to an argument that you're making, that does not mean that you are actually wrong. 
you could start researching more into their perspective. You could look into the points they've raised. And I remember one time Eric and I were having a conversation with uh, an Orthodox rabbi, a different one this time. Uh, we were having a conversation and we were talking about whether the New Testament's claim that Yeshua is God manifest in human form is consistent with the Tanakh. And he raised a strong objection that I thought it was really strong. I thought my, my position was at the moment very weak. I didn't know how to respond. And instead of leaving and telling him that, oh, I have the answer, I just, I just have to go. I, I told him that was a good response. And I would have to think about that more. And I did. I researched more. I looked into it. I talked with people who have dealt with these issues. I, I looked into his perspective. And I came back and we had a wonderful conversation. But this may have been prevented had I pretended I knew the answer when, in fact, I didn't. And then number 11 is state what you believe as precisely as possible. So the only way to be understood is to be understandable. And the best way to ensure you are communicating what you actually believe to someone is to state it as precisely as possible. So again, at the beginning, it still may be a jumbled mess, but hopefully each time you attempt to state it as precisely as you can, it improves each time. So this is so that you can, this is so that you are being sure that you are communicating what you actually believe. And the best way to do this, I have found, is to have many different conversations about a topic with many different people. And another way you could practice this is to write. So again, just like speaking, writing forces you to constrain your abstract thoughts into the limitations of English grammar and your vocabulary. And this forces you to think and articulate your position even more precisely. And it's definitely helpful if at the moment you can't find a conversation partner. And so this way, in your pursuit of truth, you're being most vulnerable and offering up your opinion to be critiqued by others when the time comes. If you are wrong, you want it to be easy for others to notice you are wrong. If you are right, you want it to be easy for people to notice that you are right. Aiming to state what you believe as precisely as possible enables this. I think we find a similar concept in James 5.16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So obviously this principle is not a matter of sin, but I think this verse provides a helpful analogy. In the same way, vulnerability of our sin brings us spiritual healing. Vulnerability in saying what we believe brings us and the person we are speaking with closer to the truth. For sure. And now we're at our final principle, and that is communicate what you believe to be true in love. And this is absolutely foundational, and it's a perfect one to end on. And I encourage you to rewatch Rabbi Seth's message on June 20th, where he digs into John 13, 34 through 35, showing us how the way Yeshua said people will recognize his disciples is by their love for one another. We're command in the Torah to love one another, and this is one of Yeshua's central teachings. And I think this love certainly applies to how we handle ourselves in tough conversations with others. I love the way Ravi Zacharias put this principle. He said, if truth is not undergirded by love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious and the truth repulsive. In a critical conversation where I'm convinced that I have the truth that could benefit the other person, I don't want that truth to be obnoxious. I don't want it to be repulsive. It's not enough to intellectually know the truth. We need to be mindful of how we communicate it. As Paul says in Colossians 4 verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, season with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So if your primary goal is to pursue truth and not just tear down the other person, not just to tear them down personally or beat their argument, then I think you will be communicating that truth in love because it's about the care for the other person. It's about trying, the goal is trying to pursue truth. And in tough conversations we engage with, I hope we can all strive to pursue truth and communicate that truth with love. And I'm not always successful at upholding these principles. I fail, but this is something I'm striving for. And when I do employ these principles, I really see the difference. It makes the conversation so productive. And even more than that, the result is that when we do this and ex you experience the openness and freedom to speak plainly about what you believe without feeling like you're vulnerable to attack or judgment. When everyone in the conversation upholds these guidelines, you could speak fervently on behalf of what you believe and push back against what you don't without feeling like your reputation is on the line or you're going to be perceived as attacking someone else. This leads to real growth and greater understanding. This leads to genuine reconciliation 
and search for truth.